Hello, everyone. Welcome to an amazing episode on Outside the Studio. I am your host. My name is Tessa Tovar. I am so excited to be here today with our guest, Irene Fair. She is a sex and intimacy coach, and I'm super excited to dive into this topic with you, Irene. Um, I have so many questions you know, as it pertains to all things relationship and sex and intimacy. But before I dive in, um, please feel free to say hello and anything you'd like to add to my introduction. Well, thank you so much for having me. Always passionate and excited to talk about this topic. Yeah, oh, me too. It's such an interesting one. You know, I just finished uh, listening to the audio book, Mating in Captivity by Esther Perel. Are you familiar with her book work? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> um, um, the, the uh, thinkers and, and uh, of course, practitioners in this field. Yeah, such an interesting uh, landscape and points of view to explore. And I myself, I'll just speak um, candidly. Most of my listeners know this about me already. I'm, I've been in a long-term monogamous relationship uh, since my early 20s. So this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And, um, and yeah, and when I say this topic, I mean, like, um, things like what happens after the honeymoon period is over in your <laughs> long-term relationship. And, uh, and this idea kind of like that as, as women, I feel like it's more common. And Irene, you tell me in your experience that it's almost like there's this different orientation for men and women in my experience, it's, e it's really easy for men to feel like, okay, I'm ready, let's go. And for me, it feels like I need a really slow romance, a slow build, um, like that wooing romance, that courting period, it still needs to happen. And it needs to happen like maybe even days before, right? Like there has to be a buildup. So maybe we start there. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you're naming one of the most important differences and one of the most important elements that a couple needs to understand. And that's the difference of how men and women experience sexual desire. So men experience what's called spontaneous sexual desire. Like you said, they're just ready. They're like a microwave, right? You punch <laughs> in a tank and they go to the high, highest temperature and they're just ready. But women have, most women have what's called responsive sexual desire. And so we're responding to environments that feel connected, where we feel sexy, where we're wooed and courted, where our partner pay, is paying attention to us, where we're, you know, we are the most important thing to them. And it usually takes days to build, right? That it's, it's the gestures that happen over this couple of days. It's the words of appreciation. It's even gifts. It, you know, I'm, I'm bringing up all the different love languages, but it's like all the different pings that your partner has throughout the day with you that start to have your, as a woman, like the woman's sense of sexiness come online and enjoyment and connection. And then it's like, ooh, ooh. I am feeling sexy. Ooh, I am ready for something more, for something sexual. Mm -hmm. And understanding these differences and knowing how to work with them and how to feed a woman's libido, how to feed this process, that makes the difference, that makes or breaks the relationship, meaning it either creates a lot of conflict and misunderstanding and resentment and bitterness or creates a sense of connection that nourishes the couple, that creates a lot of passionate sex and that has both people feel understood and met and like they can be themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's very much rooted in this difference and understanding how we, how we access our sexual desire. That for women, it's at the end of a journey of, of this wooing journey, which needs to happen just as much when we're dating as it, when we're 30 years into a relationship. Mm -hmm. And for men, that's not the same. That they, they have access to it kind of as a switch or microwave, whatever analogy uh, resonates for you the most. I wonder, so a couple of things. First, I wonder, is it, it, it seems like there's this, 
maybe it's a misconception, maybe it's my misconception that that puts a lot of pressure on the man to like, uh, or the, the male figure in this relationship to do all of that extra wooing work. And so I think my question is, is there a way that we can do that for ourselves as women? How do we like take the reins a little bit and drive our libido without relying on someone else to do that? Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love, love, love this question. And I talk about this so much. And there is absolutely a need for us to be in charge of our own libido and initiating things that would work for us. So our responsive sexual desire kind of sets us up to be like a leaf in the wind. Like if the wind is right, the leaf goes in the right direction. But if the wind is wrong, we get blown away into somewhere where we don't want to go. And so it creates a sense of powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And it puts, like you said, all the responsibility on the man where he needs to do all the work to, to uh, woo us and to romanticize us is to get us going. And yeah, that's a huge amount of pressure. So I talk about this in terms of the wind being life wind being that things that that's the responsive sex that's the responsive nature of our sexual desire but we can be the sailboat in relationship to that wind we can harness the wind mm -hmm. so for example if we know that being connected to our partners is one of the things that turns us on that we initiate to snuggle up together or we, we, we ask for that connection with our partners. If we know that we need prolonged touch, couple, like in the couple of days leading up to when we would like to have sex, that we initiate it too and we initiate it for our own pleasure. So instead of waiting for the man to initiate making out or touch, we do it. And we reach out and we're like, hey, I'd love for you, I'd love to touch you or I'd like for you to touch me right now. It feels so good. And we create those situations. And of course, there's things that we can do on our own completely. Like if you're wired more for, if you're wired more sensually and for example, baths turn you on or turning on music that feels good to you turns you on by all means do those things if sitting down to meditation is something that grounds you and connects you to your body do that learn to turn yourself on learn to again create these environments or activities that help you connect to your body and to your sensuality and to pleasure and those together what you do on your own and then what you initiate with your partner then allow you to be that sailboat in the wind. You, you harness the wind, you harness your responsiveness to work for you. Yeah, I love that. That's a great analogy. It can really visually see that. Um, and it, so the second part of that question, I think is, is it, it, when you get to the point in a relationship, when like um, maybe you feel like you've tried everything and nothing works and you're just kind of like, oh, I want to give up. Um, maybe you don't have sex regularly or it's been a really long time since you have. Um, is that like a point where you would recommend to a client to reassess the situation? Can you save it? What do you do at that point? Oh, well, that's a difficult question because it really depends on what's happening outside of that too. So are you staying connected to your partner during that? Are you both feeling sad and lost or are you attacking each other over that? Are you fighting and blaming each other over that? And so in the first situation, there's absolutely hope there. And you can not only salvage that, but to grow from that. But if there is attack and blame and contempt, that's a harder situation. There is already so many scars, so many wounds. And that's hard to tell whether that's truly 
uh, revivable. Mm. So it's really, it's how do you tackle this? How do you deal with not knowing or being stuck or feeling powerless? How do you deal with not getting your way and not knowing how to change it? That really, again, allows you to either go one way where you stay connected or you attack each other. Yeah. So yeah, it's a difficult question to answer without really knowing what's happening to the couple. For but sure. Most people, yeah. If I may say that the key to solving any of this is not waiting until that point. Mm. The key is to recognize, and that's really true for all of us, that we don't know a lot. We don't know about sex and love in a long-term relationship. It's something that's been really honestly talked about in the last five years, mm-hmm. and only a few of us are talking about it. Yeah. Um, Esther Perel, of course, one of the one of the people talking about it. And I know for myself, my clients come to me and they have they they've exhausted their paths with therapists and couples coaches who don't go here at all. So this is still very much a new area. Uh, but the point is again that don't wait till it gets really bad. Assume you don't know. Assume that you you want support in this area and go early. Mm-hmm. Work with someone who's going to help you set yourselves up for success. Like if you you know we go to if a lot of people um, when they decide to become moms or when they get pregnant they go to a, a coach to find out how to go through pregnancy. You do that before uh, you you know the birth of a child. Yeah. Uh, rather than, well, of course you can go afterwards too, but it's like preparing for it. And the same thing with sex and love in a long-term relationship, preparing yourself, setting yourselves up for success. Yeah. I really do think you're right. It's, that's a good point. It's rather kind of new realm of open exploration. And, um, I, you know, thinking back to like childhood and adolescence and, um, adult modeling, um, there wasn't a lot of, conversation around that. Um, I think I was personally lucky to have parents that were not shy and they taught me early about safe sex and were open to talking about it. And, um, of course it's not like they wanted me to go out there and have sex, but they wanted me to be safe. So I do feel, um, like one of the lucky ones, but there's also, there's still this kind of society. I think you talk about this too, a societal feeling as a woman that um, there's almost like a shame or a disconnect between body and sexuality, or maybe it's mind and and body disconnect about being a sexual being and not, how do I do that and not be labeled by someone else or by myself as a slut, quote unquote, a lack of a better word. How do I connect with a healthy, healthy sense of libido when maybe I've never even done that before in my life? Um, you know, like what if I don't even know how to answer the question of what turns me on? I don't know if a bath turns me on. Like I've taken tons of baths in my life, but I've never really thought about it like that. What would you say to that aspect? Yeah. So my interest and focus very much is on the meeting of body and mind. And when it comes to sexuality, we certainly have ideas of how we should be sexual and the way I like to think about it is that we all know how to be sexual. We know what goes into what. We know uh, the basics of it. But most of us don't know how to experience and enjoy our sexuality and actually feel it in our bodies. So in the book, What Do Women Want? by the author whom I cannot remember at this moment, um, <laughs> No, I cannot remember his name, but I see it somewhere. It's, it's in the called class. "What Do Women Want." We'll find. I'll find the author for you. Yes. Um, I think it's Richard Bergner, or something like that. Anyway, he cites a study, uh, one of the most famous studies in this in this field, um, where women are mon- hooked up and monitored um, in their genitals as they're watching. I believe it was porn, and women had no idea that their genitals were off the chart excited, (laughs) off the chart responsive to what they were watching. 
but their mind said, no, this doesn't turn me on. And there is a big disconnect for, for most women between our minds and our bodies. Again, we, we think we conceptualize what it's like to be sexual. And so much of it is around how we look and what we, um, like what kind of message we send, but we're very disconnected from our bodies. And it's the body that feels sexuality. Mm-hmm. The body isn't sexual as, as in like, my hair is brown, I'm a br- I am a brunette. Um, I don't feel my hair, but with sexuality, it's something that we feel. It's not just something that we are, but something that we feel, that we embody, that we experience. And that disconnect, creates a lot of problems in terms of not knowing what you want, not knowing what your, how your body experiences pleasure, not knowing what, what turns you on because you can't feel it, right? Like you said, I've taken a thousand baths. I don't know if it, it turns me on. That's because there's a disconnect in registering pleasure from that bath and letting you know, oh, you enjoy it your body enjoys it. You're experiencing pleasure in your body. And that's, again, that's my interest is bringing the mind and the body together, synchronizing them and making sexuality a felt experience, making sexual desire for women a felt experience rather than something that they act or perform or that they show rather than they enjoy for themselves. Yeah. Well, I imagine that anything like that, where there is a disconnect takes time and it takes practice and patience. And sometimes we might get it right. And sometimes it might feel, you know, I'm thinking of this uh, concept of fake it till you make it. Uh, I think it was Amy Cuddy. She, she did a Ted talk um, on this concept. And uh, so, I mean, I wonder if it can be applied to this situation. Can we fake it until we make it? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, I, you know, I have a different spin on this um, in terms of faking it, that it's not so much faking it as much as uh, being willing to fail. Mm-hmm. And so my saying is, if you want to fuck well, you have to learn how to fail well. Meaning you have to be able to take risks and to fail and to make mistakes and to do the wrong thing and to learn from it. Mm-hmm. And because the sex piece, it's not just about the motions. It's not just about positions. It's not just about the orgasm. I'm interested in the kind of sex that's nourishing, the kind of sex that leaves you feeling more open, freer, more confident, more expanded, rather than again, just the the positions and the, the, the surface things. And so, to get to that state of expansion and freedom and confidence, you have to take risks. You have to learn to be okay with failure, with mistakes, with not getting it right the first time or even the 10th time. Mm. So it's that that's the failure piece. So it's not so much that you, it's fake it till you make it, but for me, it's fail till you make it. Fail and fail and fail and fail again. But use those failures for learning. Use those failures for growing rather than um, like a tick against you. Yeah. Oh, that's such a nice reminder. I really, you know, that's nice. It's very forgiving. It's compassionate to yourself. And it's just a reminder that everything that we do in life is this, it doesn't have to be perfect. There's so much pressure for things to be perfect. And I think, especially in such an intimate setting, you know, it's scary to put yourself out there, try something new, be vulnerable. Um, what if my partner doesn't like it? What if I don't like it? So yeah, that's such a sweet reminder. I appreciate that. I'm curious, Irene, um, what your story is, how did you come into this work? Will you take me through your journey? Thank you for that question. Well, my story is bittersweet. Thankfully, the sweet part is happening now. Um, But the bitter part was that 
I was in a situation that so many clients, so many of my clients are today, which was, uh, I was in a relationship which started out beautifully, met a man, we were in love, we were this perfect couple that other people looked at and said, we want to have what you're having. And sex in the beginning was exciting and passionate. And over time, it actually in a, in a very short, quick period of time, I started to struggle with first lubrication, then painful sex, then loss of libido. So we went from this amazing beginning to a sexless marriage in just a matter of a couple of years. And this was happening all before I turned 30. Actually, I was already divorced by the time I was 30. So this was in my mid to late 20s. And there was this piece about my own libido. There was this piece about sex in a long-term relationship, like what happens past the honeymoon stage that was so confusing. It was so heartbreaking. Here we were in love and this was happening and we didn't know how to deal with this. And my own experience of losing my libido coming from a, from feeling rather sexual, rather alive to then having absolutely no desire for my husband or for anyone and feeling responsible and feeling broken and feeling like I wasn't feminine enough or woman enough to, to desire sex. So all of those experiences were incredibly painful, incredibly heartbreaking and caused uh, they weren't the cause of the divorce, but they certainly caused us to pull away from each other and disconnect and, and then get divorced. And for me, for four or five years afterwards, I was very disconnected from myself. Again, I took responsibility for what happened. I thought it was me. I thought, again, I wasn't good enough. And I shut down completely. I wasn't dating. I wasn't I was celibate, but even more than that, I just, I wasn't even out at all. I wasn't available to even connect because I really shut down. And after those five years, well, in those five years, I struggled with depression. I struggled with just um, my own sense of aliveness and, and like desire to, to live. And I don't mean that in the sense of being suicidal, but just like going through the motions, not really desiring to be engaged in anything deeply. And it culminated in, um, I love how Renee Brown coins it, uh, a nervous breakdown slash spiritual awakening. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> it certainly looked like a nervous breakdown at that moment. Um, I was still in my corporate career and that was falling apart. I was making horrible decisions. My health was falling apart. I was just so depressed that I could only get out of bed and walk my dog. Like I existed for my dog's sake. Um, to having this amazing retreat, uh, women's retreat in the Bay Area where I was living at the time. And in the hands of a couple of uh, amazing life coaches, I came to literally this awakening that I had been living a life that wasn't my own and that I had betrayed myself, not because I, I you know, pretended anything, but that I didn't know myself. And I kept doing things that were against my own intuition or who I was, but I just had no idea I was doing that. And that I wasn't living my dreams and that I was living other people's fears. They weren't my own, but I was living them. I was walking in people's shoes um, and footsteps, but not really truly being honoring of myself. And that was such a, a powerful, tr true awakening. Like I remember coming out of that weekend, seeing life differently, literally, that like there was more color in the trees. There was more color in the sky when I walked out of that retreat. And that led me on a, on a personal journey to understand myself. And um, first it was kind of general understanding of myself, but soon I, real I realized I need to understand the sexual piece. I need to, in that, at that time, I thought I need to fix myself because I really thought I was broken. 
but I stumbled upon amazing sex coaches who helped me really understand myself and discover myself and teach me about myself and, you know, give me the tools to learn about myself. Um, and then realized I wasn't actually broken and that what happens with couples in a, in a long-term relationship, even in the short term of a potentially long-term relationship is incredibly common. And what happens to women's libido is incredibly common. And, you know, the misunderstanding about what that libido is and how it works is part of it. Um, I also, and I'd love to share also, I talk about how sex actually naturally dies in a long-term relationship. And I break it, that down and talk about how there's a, uh, there's two types that naturally die. And then there's a third type that sustains itself. So all that work came out of my own experience and the curiosity that followed afterwards where I realized what I went through is so common. And what I believed and so many other women and men believe is bullshit. And we need to debunk these myths and we need to really get not only information out, but tools out for couples. And my passion is monogamous couples in a long-term relationship. I want to help couples like, like the couple that I was um, to go through this and to avoid the heartbreak and to avoid the, um, the, the devastation that goes through when you're in a, in a sexless marriage. Of course, my goal is to prevent that, but then also, of course, fix that, heal that for couples who do go through that. Yeah. So yeah. that's now the sweet part that I get to do this and that I help couples not at least have the tools to, um, to go through that, support mm -hmm. it and, and, and um, in a different way. Yeah. Wow. What a journey. Yes. Thank you for sharing. And I would love for you to expound upon the, the concept of libido, the myths around it, the different types you mentioned, um, you know, as it pertains to your work, please, please tell me more. I want to hear. Yeah. So, you know, these myths, um, and there's, by the way, a free video series on my website. So for listeners who want to check it out in more depth, um, I think the, the three videos expand over an hour and a half. So there's so much more that I can say in, in these um, few minutes, but I will summarize this and I want to contextualize these myths that these myth, myths are very common and they actually keep women away from the nutrients that allow our libido to come alive. And I really think of it as there are these things, these elements, these nutrients, these uh, essential nutrients that we need. And when we believe these myths, we keep ourselves away from these nutrients. And then we feel shut down, literally, like the lights are not on, like we're, we can't access this, this sexual energy inside. And um, the first myth is I, I talked about it a little bit in the beginning, which is that we should have spontaneous sexual desire like men and we should just turn on and it's simply not true and it causes a lot of shame like what's wrong with me why look look at my partner he can do it he's thinking about sex all the time why am i thinking about laundry the kids and this and that and and everything else but sex there must be something wrong with me and there isn't Again, differences in sexual desire and how they work. But when we think that we're broken and that we should have sexual, uh, that we should have spontaneous sexual desire, we rob ourselves of the nutrients. We, and, and we introduce shame. So that's myth number one. Myth number two is we could be super women. We could do it all. We can give it all to everyone at every hour of the day. And we should be able to crawl into bed at the end of the day and be sexual. And I can't tell you how many times, as, as ridiculous as all this sounds, how many times I hear this from women where they, they blame themselves for being exhausted and depleted and not being sexual enough. And the myth here is that you can run on an empty engine and you know with an engine if the engine runs out of fuel 
we don't blame the engine. We don't think that the engine is stupid or, or not good enough. We just refill it. But when it comes to us, we, again, blame ourselves, we shame ourselves, and we feel like we're not doing enough. And the reality is an, an engine with an empty tank is not going to go anywhere. Libido is not going to turn on if you're coming from this empty tank. So this is a myth that really needs to be not only debunked, but that it, there's so much here that, that, we, that we as women need to do to fill our tanks, right? So much, and so much of it can be sexual, but it's also just learning to manage our energy and learning how to get support and not do everything for everyone on our own by ourselves. So that's myth number two. Again, we can do it all. We can't. Um, myth number three is that just because you're married or just because you're in love with a man of your dreams that you should be able to be sexual. Hmm. And that's a huge myth because, again, I have women and couples coming to me. And when we talk about what their life looks like, it's they see each other in passing for five minutes in the morning. They talk during the day about the kids or the chores or the, you know, the finances, and they see each other for 15 minutes before bed. And they assume that they should be sexual or the woman assumes that she should be sexual because they're in love. Well, they're not actually connecting as lovers. They're not actually seeing each other. She's not getting any connection. She's not getting any of the wooing or the, the attention from her partner. Her libido is not going to get turned on. So just because you're married, just because you're in love does not guarantee that your libido goes on, that we need connection with our partners. We need to experience each other as lovers, not just uh, child managers or, or pet sitters or, you know, financial managers of your household. But that's really important. And that's, again, an essential nutrient. And the last one is that um, we should access sexual desire on demand. Like, I should be able to get turned on when my partner wants to. And it kind of ties all of these together. We don't have sex, uh, spontaneous sexual desire and we do need connection. And when we're exhausted, that on-demand piece doesn't work at all. And where all of these myths come from is because we're comparing ourselves to men. And that's where we, we get in trouble so much. We look at men and they're able to do all those things. And we think we should be able to, but that denies our makeup. And it also denies us the journey that we need to go through for our libido to get turned on. The journey of pleasure, of connection, the journey of playfulness and flirtatiousness and fun. The journey that has you feel closer to your partner rather than just a warm body next to them. So all of those things actually make our experience richer. And by trying to be more like men, we actually rob ourselves of the nutrients. We rob ourselves of the things that would actually make sex an incredibly pleasurable, connecting, freeing, confidence building, nourishing activity that it can be. Mm. And so it's, it's understanding all these things and then using your voice to get what you need. That is what women's libido is all about. Like I said, that, that honoring of ourselves, that um, the, the, the self-confidence comes from being able to be that sailboat, not that the leaf in the wind, mm -hmm. from harnessing our nature to work for us. And that's, you, that you do by using your voice by asking for what you need and by negotiating, shaping the experience to work for you. And did I hear you say that libido will just naturally die? Like as um, I keep referring to with the honeymoon phase, that this is a normal, natural part of any relationship in the 
from the experience, I guess, of a woman. Uh, yes, from experience of a woman, uh, there's definitely this aspect of the libido dying. Mm -hmm. And I talk about it also in the context of sex, of, of that kind of passionate sex that you have in the beginning of the relationship. That will naturally die. Um, and absolutely, it's connected to women's libido. And um, I don't know how much time we have in terms of going into that, but I do have an, also a video that goes into more details that I yeah. would love to share. Well, I think, you know, if it's possible for you to share, because I think this is a really important topic, um, not something you get to hear spoken about a lot. So I'd love to take, you know, if it takes five minutes, great. Um, and then of course, in the show notes, I'll put links to your free gifts and your videos. Um, but yeah, please, please tell me more about this. All right. So I, I will do my best to do it concisely. Um, so when I talk about the death of sex and how it naturally happens, I look at the, basically uh, the lifetime of a relationship. And so when we meet someone and when we're dating, there's a lot of sexual attraction in the beginning, typically, not for everyone, but typically there's a lot of sexual attraction, there's newness, there's excitement for each other. And in a way, how we are designed evolutionary, evolutionarily, uh, it works with this, right? We're supposed to mate and procreate and our hormones support that. So in the beginning, there's a lot of primal sexual desire for each other. And there also looks like the libidos are similar. We both want each other. We both can't wait to take our uh, clothes off and get our hands on each other. And so in this stage, what gets created is what I call friction sex. And friction sex is really about like having one body next to another. It's just it's, it's that, that draw, right? The, the having your hands on, on each other piece. And it, it's, a, it's an exciting phase. It's a very passionate phase. And there is a lot of literally movement and friction happening. The bodies are moving. It's just a kind of like a, a very alive stage of sex. But there's a problem with this stage because it's heavily driven by hormones and it's heavily physical. That there's actually diminishing returns in this kind of sex. So for example, it's, there's a rush towards penetration. There's a rush towards orgasm. And oftentimes you get into a, a habit. So you do the same thing over and over. And the couple of, first couple of times they're exciting. Third, fourth, fifth time you're doing the same thing. 25th time, start to feel not so exciting. So there's a natural dwindling of passion. What's also true about friction sex for a lot of people is that it's all about the moment and having that heat and passion drive it. And what it often excludes is vulnerability and emotions and connection. Those, of course, sometimes add to the moment, but other times they actually slow down the moment. They make the moment awkward. They make the moment vulnerable and you, know, you feel exposed or you, you're scared to share something. And usually friction sex does not make room for that. So it's, it's a single dimensional kind of sex. And so what happens for women during this stage is a lot of the times we get bored with the same thing happening over and over, but we feel scared. We don't wanna reject our partner so we don't say anything. So we just kind of go with it. So you start to see already uh, the woman uh, not engaging as much, not participating and not showing all of herself in terms of using her voice. And I call this type of sex also good weather sex because again, you don't, you're not doing anything to ruin the mood. You just, you're keeping things fun and light and, and just, yeah we're not going to go into these, these messy areas, but of course, speaking up and being vulnerable are one of those messy areas. And so that also robs the, the experience of emotional richness and of connection. So 
you have this type of sex that's again, just about the bodies and with the diminishing returns each time, it feels less and less nourishing and more and more kind of empty or lonely. And so a lot of couples don't progress out of this stage at all. Uh, a lot of couples are able to maintain friction sex for years or decades with the help of drugs and alcohol. Because drugs and alcohol, especially just even alcohol, just regular consumption of a couple of glasses of wine with dinner allows you to just keep it light, not go into these mushy emotional areas. And they're able to maintain it. But again, it stays very surface level. And um, couples who see the, the diminishing returns, they usually conclude that well, we just lost our attraction to each other. We just lost, we just lost it. Like it was just a fleeting thing without really realizing that actually friction sex is meant to die. It just doesn't have anything to sustain it. It doesn't have the depth or the richness. So, um, so friction sex again, just has this, this natural shelf life. But there's also another time when, when couples resort to friction sex, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But before that, I want to introduce a set, the second type. And the second type is what I call validation sex. And validation sex becomes uh, available when you start to connect to each other emotionally. Now, it could be that you start out with friction sex, and then you start to connect emotionally, and you switch to validation sex. It may be that you go into validation sex from the beginning and skip that kind of friction sex stage. But what validation sex is, is about is that it, it has emotions, it has feelings. It's about also expression of love. So you may be falling in love or again, starting to connect with each other. And so it can feel like a warm blanket. It feels like you're making love to each other. It's a, it's a really beautiful type of sex. But when there's love, there's also fear of loss. And so naturally couples at this stage will want to seek a, a sense of safety or validation that they're safe, that they're meaning like they're safe as a couple, that they're okay, that they're gonna last, that they're gonna make it, that, that their partner is not gonna go away. And everything in sex becomes a validation of that. So you saying yes to me in sex means you want me, which means I'm important to you, which means we're, we're good, we're safe. And you desiring me and expressing love again means we're okay. But in any relationship, two things happen. One is as the relationship deepens, as the responsibilities start to pile up, as you have pets, a mortgage, financial responsibilities, kids, even just like uh, commitments to go on vacation or out to dinner that evening, what also starts to show up is disappointments, disagreements and disappointments and resentments about imbalances in the relationship of who does the dishes or who carries the mental and emotional burden. And so re resentments start to pile up. And what happens is that you don't always want to have sex. You don't always desire me. And I take that as we're not okay. okay. So the presence of validation means we're okay, but the absence of it means we're not okay. And that starts to rock the boat. It starts to feel like, wow, what's happening to our relationship? And we start to use sex to create that safety. Those are two different things, emotional safety and sex. Yes, they work together, but they're not one and the same, but we start to blend them together. Another thing that happens is because you are seeking a sense of safety through sex, you start to play it safe in sex. Because again, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to create a sense of unsafety. And so for women, what that looks like is typically women won't ask for what they need. The, the wording that I often hear that I use myself is, 
I don't want to hurt his feelings by asking him to take time for me. I don't want to inconvenience him because I need 45 minutes of touch time and he only needs five. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to rock the boat. So women will keep quiet about what they need. They'll keep quiet about what's not working for them. And of course, that results in them not enjoying sex. That results in the libido starting to shut down because she's not getting the nutrients. And the man will see that she's struggling. He can see that maybe what he does hurts her. And he pulls back and he says, honey, you initiate when you're ready. I'll just sit here and wait. But that robs her from the connection and the wooing and the playfulness that are also nutrients. So they start to collude. They're all, they start to play safe, safe with each other and they collude and it just starts to go down again. It's like that downward spiral. And so a couple of things end up happening. A lot of the times it becomes evident that there's one person who, who is a high desire partner and another one who's a low desire partner. And that differential, different, that differential creates conflict, creates incessant, like, when are we going to have sex? Why aren't we having sex? Why don't you initiate? Why don't you want me kind of dynamic? So the safety starts to deteriorate and um, this becomes a battleground for attachment type, attachment wounds from childhood. And um, that's a, also another topic that I can speak for hours about, but we start to play out ways that we, uh, that we dealt with the absence of love in our lives. So it's a, it's a very painful process. So there are couples that end up in vicious cycles of pursuing and retreating. I need you. I want you. I need your validation. And then another person pulling away and saying, I can't give it to you. I'm hiding from you. I don't want to deal with this. Um, so they put up walls of hurt and resentment on both sides. Or they become roommates. Mm -hmm. And they just don't want to deal with this at all. Like it's too anxiety producing. It's too, um, yeah, don't want to touch it with a thousand foot pole. Um, but most couples kind of stay in someone in the, in the middle. They, they, like I said, they collude, they play it safe. They keep the status quo. They continue to have sex. And that's when they actually resort to friction sex. They have just enough sex to create an illusion of safety. They have just enough sex to let their partners know that they're important to them, that they desire them. But it's sex that's devoid of eroticism of true connection of pleasure it's just going through the motions it's just you know checking that box and so that gets them nowhere it just it, it they they maintain something that's just has no taste or nutrients or value and so um here sex naturally dies even though they may be having sex but but it's not passion and it's not erotic it's not connecting and so whether they it's at the end of friction sex or then the validation sex basically couples get very confused they don't understand what's happening they feel angry at each other and it looks like they're just they can't make it and so that's that's what i call the end of sex where it's not just even the end of the honeymoon phase but like this this gradual progression towards distance and drifting away from each other. And of course, it's very painful to be inside of it. But how I see it is that it's a call to action. It's a wake up call that you've just exhausted. Basically, you've exhausted um, what these types of sex can give you. And now it's a moment to create a different type of sex, not one that's driven by hormones, not one that's driven by a need for safety, but one that's driven by a desire to connect to each other erotically, to witness each other, to see each other and be seen by each other through pleasure, through sexual connection. 
And so the third type of sex I call connection sex because it's the connection that draws people together. And it's something that you create. It's something that is intentional and it's something that's more than just about sex, that it's a way of life. It's decisions about vulnerability and availability to each other and decisions about practicing curiosity and learning to turn yourself on and asking for what you need, all these things, that it's a very conscious, very mindful approach to, to sex and intimacy that again, is not like not driven by hormones or, or kind of the, the natural love, the demands of love that this is a conscious type. And this is the type of sex that survives the age of time or the, 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 the progression of a relationship. It survives over the, the lifetime of a relationship because it's equipped already with consciousness and awareness and curiosity that, that allows you to ride the waves of life from, you know, from, from, from child rearing to menopause, to aging, to all the things that happen in, in between these stages, it allows you to ride the, the, the changes of life. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. What a, Irene, thank you for taking us through those stages. That's so valuable. I'm really glad we took the time to do it. Um, and it's, it's a hopeful note to end on um, a great way to wrap up, I think. Um, and I feel like I could sit here and talk to you all day about this subject. So maybe we'll have to have a round two, but I will leave it at that. And I will invite people to find you on your website, Irene Fair. I'll have the spelling and everything in our show notes, but it, it's Irene, I-R-E-N-E-F-E-H-R.com. And thank you so much for all of the free gifts and tips that you will provide us and that you already do on your amazing website. So thank you so much for your time today um, and for sharing all of your wonderful wisdom with us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.